Good evening, everybody. Today is Tuesday, September 20th, 2022. Today is a caseless defense webinar. It will be one and a half hours, so we're going to 10 o'clock. Uh, so caseless defense uh, webinars are an hour and a half uh, this month. So um, before we start, does anybody have any questions about anything? Let me ask this, is my audio working? Can you raise your hand to confirm the audio is working? Okay, perfect, thank you so much. Um, so does anybody have any questions about anything before we start? So I see Rita has her hand up. I'm going in that direction. Says you're self-muted, Rita. Oh, can you Hi. hear me, Rita? So, Hi. Yeah. Hi. You have a question? No, actually, I thought that is. Uh, um, I was wondering if uh, if you are asking for participation. I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, hear. No, yeah, just just general questions about anything. No, no, no. Thank you. You you went yesterday, so let's give somebody else an opportunity to be in the hot seat. If nobody else raises their hand, I'll come back to you. Okay. Laura, I'm heading in your direction. Says you're self-muted. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes. Hi. You want to be part of the hot seat? I would. I have a specific case that I wanted okay. to. And you have out. not been on the hot seat for the last several days, correct? No, I have not. I've never been okay. on before. Okay. So, um, give me a second here. I am going to erase my screen so you can't see it so I can find your list. What specific list is it in? Uh, my GYN list. GYN, okay. Yeah. And you submitted your list? Yes. Of course, nothing's in order. Why would it be in order? Hold on a second. I see it now. What's your case number? Um, sorry, I don't have my. Um, it's okay. my what, what case, section? Uh, vaginal. Say that again. So you broke up. I think it's a vaginal hysterectomy section. It's vaginal hysterectomy. Yeah, let me just. Fifty-seven year old or fifty-five year old? Yeah. Uh, I believe the fifty-five year old, the one who had urinary uh, urinary, yeah. urinary retention. A vaginal hysterectomy, um, a, sl a sling, an anterior pair, 55. I think that's her. Let me see. number two. Sorry, I can pull up my list. Yeah, it's. You can see, you can see yeah, it. Yeah, it was case two. It case two. Okay. So discuss that case for me or just present it. Yeah, I think I, I feel like I just said it. I presented it poorly, I think, in my list. So I just kind of wanted, I could explain okay. it it. So um, this was a patient who presented to me as a new patient, however, had been um, a part of my group practice for a long period of time now. And um, as well as she had been a part of our pelvic floor and incontinence um, uh, program. So she came to me complaining of worsening symptoms of stress urinary incontinence. Um, she was leaking with coughing, sneezing, um, and just um, like exercise. And she also was feeling um, pressure in her vaginal area. She had seen a partner of mine for the past 10 years, and I was able to review notes from the past few years, and she had had a known um, stage two prolapse with um, the anterior compartment being the leading edge. So um, that partner had left and she had kind of um, just been following up with our pelvic floor and incontinence um, center, which is just run by a mid-level provider. And they, because of her um, complaints about incontinence, had done urodynamic testing on her. Um, so let me ask you this. Is it yeah. a requirement to do urodynamics for stress urinary incontinence? No, it's not. Um, usually, 
if a patient has symptoms consistent with just stress urinary incontinence, um, they have a normal PVR, you can reproduce the stress urinary incontinence on exam and you can visualize urethral hypermobility and they don't have, um, you know, stage two or greater prolapse, you could uh, move forward with um, treatment. So I guess, and I guess another question would be in what situations is urodynamics recommended? Um, urodynamics would be recommended if you were concerned that there was potentially like a mixed picture of incontinence, there were signs of overactive bladder, um, or if the patient had significant prolapse, you know, greater than stage two, or if you were um, examining them, you couldn't reproduce the prolapse in the office, or you couldn't visualize any urethral hypermobility, or if when you did a post-foot residual, it seemed significant. There was concern for like a neurogenic bladder. Um, Any other indications? Um, um, oh my gosh, not that I can think of right now, but. So you said overactive bladder. How do you diagnose overactive bladder? Um, Overactive bladder would, um, would be suspicious for overactive bladder if a patient was telling me they had um, feelings of like urgency and frequency and all the, like all of a sudden they felt a strong urge to avoid and had to rush to the bathroom feeling like they wouldn't make it, um, but they weren't necessarily um, leaking when they coughed or sneezed. Um, yeah. And so what's like, the underlying, you know, the underlying issue or pathology? Detrusor or muscle overactivity. So that could be seen on urodynamics. Um, when you're, uh, yeah, watching the batter contractions, uh, either with filling, sometimes you can see that the bladder contracts randomly, um, or during flow. And so how do you treat overactive bladder? Um, overactive bladder can be treated with um, like conservative treatment, so bladder training, um, where you um, just do timed voids um, so that you're not, you try to hold on, like, I guess, basically try not to try to void on a schedule um, so your bladder doesn't get too full. And then you also kind of control when you're, ideally control when you're avoiding. Um, also, you can do giant diet changes. Um, so avoiding caffeine, um, avoiding potentially drinking in the evenings, um, and limiting the amount of fluid that you take in in a day. Um, overactive bladder um, can also be treated with medication. Um, the one that comes to mind is Mirbetric, Mirbetric and I'm blanking on the other one. Um, so what's the mechanism of action? Amira Bergman. Of Amira Bergman. It is a. I, w I would have to look that up. I can't remember. I've confused it. What, what, what is the contraindicated? Hypertension. Anything else? Um, I am not sure right now. So continue with your presentation of the case. Um, so, uh, the patient, yeah, so I, um, reviewed the history with the patient, went over, um, the focused his history and exam, and I was able to review, um, her urodynamic testing, which, um, was indicative of basically she had a normal filling, um, she had a normal um, bladder volume and a normal normal post void residual, but it did show that um, when her prolapse was reduced and also when it wasn't, that she had reproducible um, 
stress urine incontinence with um, Valsalva. Um, and I also did an exam and I was was able to compare. So her prior exam um, was done using POPQ. Um, and I think the last one they had was from like, um, I think maybe five years prior. And um, it showed that her, that she mostly, she really just had anterior, anterior compartment prolapse. And it didn't, on my exam, did not appear to be worsened. The only difference I noticed, noticed was that um, her, Posterior fornix, which had been noted to be the same, what had been noted to be the same as her total vaginal length, was now about two and a half centimeters more, was distal or less. And so I thought that this was probably contributing to the increased pressure she was feeling and discomfort. So um, she had already been trying conservative measures with um, our pelvic floor incontinence therapy. She had done a, some pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, she had um, yeah, and she had declined a pessary um, that they had offered her, and she was interested in having surgery. So I discussed with her um, doing a hysterectomy um, repair of her um, cystocele, her, her anterior compartment prolapse, as well as um, doing a sling. And I do retropubic midurethral slings. I also wasn't sure. I don't do apical um, support. Like I don't uh, do those uh, procedures, but I have like all, most of my partners do. Um, so I did refer her to meet to see one of my partners to discuss the potential to have a procedure done for apical support. And when he met with her, um, they had a discussion. He felt that she actually had decent apical support, even though she had potentially worsening prolapse than in prior years. And they decided to not move forward with, he did not think that she needed like a sacrospinous ligament suspension or um, your, uh, um, yeah, I and mean, really he, that was what he was planning on doing. He didn't think that she needed anything and that if I just did a prophylactic McCall's coldoplasty, that would be significant to prevent um, worsening prolapse. So did you do a McCall? I did. So can you discuss with me how you do a McCall? So when I do my, uh, I did a vaginal hysterectomy on this patient. So when I did um, my vaginal hysterectomy, when I took um, my uterosacral bites, I um, left them tagged. And then when I went to close the cuff, I um, first start by doing an external stitch of the micral, um, and I incorporate the utero, uh, uterus cycles into the uh, base, into the posterior part of the cuff, um, and I go. I tied this. I go through the vagina, um, and then I usually do two more if I can. Sometimes more, but usually at least two um, other sutures with a more uh, like a proline, and I um, incorporate the uterus cycles, and I basically run across the um, posterior. Parotid. So you use a you, you use a permanent permanent suture. I I do. Okay, and you were going to say? And I go across um, to um, the posterior peritoneum um, and like the top of the vaginal uh, cuff, but not going through the vagina all the way. And then I basically close um, just uh, the deepest one first um, and then close it to the external one. And then I close my cuff, usually in this case, especially if I'm doing an anterior pair, just um, vertically. So what happens to the uterosacral ligaments in a McCall? Uh, they get pulled to the midline. And what other options are available for prophylaxis of vault prolapse? Um, she, um, I guess a uterosacral ligament suspension. And what happens to the uterosacrals in a uterosacral ligament suspension? Um, in that procedure, they are left more in their anatomic position. The uterosacrals are attached to the cuff um, on either ipsilateral side. So they aren't quite pulled as, so they aren't pulled to the midline quite as much as when 
Um, I do a McCall's, McCall's coldoplasty. Why did the patient only have a right stop injecting me? Um, I, during the case, I was had a very, very difficult time um, adequately visualizing the left fallopian tube, um, despite her being in Trendelenburg and um, having multiple, so like having an assistant, I could not adequately visualize it. Um, and the bowel just kept coming into view. And as I was trying to like move it out of the way, I felt like I was causing more trauma to um, my pedicle. So I decided, made the decision just to do a right salpingectomy. Okay, let's stop there. So what's your concern about this case? Now, the first thing you wrote, symptomatic uterine prolapse, but yet you didn't say that you did anything. Right. So luckily, you had the time to bring up McCall. I would have included the McCall. Yeah, I just, I was worried that, that because I didn't do like an actual, I only did something prophylactic and I, I didn't do an apical support procedure that that would. But you explained it, you had your colleague yeah. evaluate her and he felt that, so I thought it was, this would, it would have been nice if you had put the McCall. And then the first thing is like, why'd you do a McCall if she had symptomatic uterine prolapse? Yeah. Okay, I always I always do it, so I'll just say that if I get an opportunity to speak about it. And again, when it comes to the case list defense section of the exam, lately what a lot of candidates have told me in the recent years, they're not really using your list cases per se, they're using it for topics. Okay. okay. But of course, it's the luck of what your examiner is going to do. Yeah, it is case number two. You would hope they would see it, you know, relatively early in the process. Yeah, of you know your case, but who knows? They may start from the back. Right. Okay. So mechanism of action of Mirabergron. Yeah. It's a beta three adrenergic receptor agonist, contraindicated in severe liver and kidney disease and uncontrolled hypertension. Okay. You were thinking of the anti-muscarinics. Yes, that's what I was thinking Oxybutin. of. Oxybutin. Okay. Oh. So when is that contraindicated? Um, uh, I, I'm, I cannot remember. So it's uncontrolled think... tachyarrhythmias, myasthenia yeah. gravis, gastric retention, narrow angle closure glaucoma. Okay. Okay. But everything else that you said sounded good. Uh, when to do urodynamics? Uh, previous history of uh, yeah, urogynecological surgery or a prior incontinent procedure, something yeah. complicated like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other than that, I thought the stuff you said was good. I would have. I didn't go into it, but you know how. You took care of the post-operative unit retention. Maybe you did, you know, clamping of the Foley at home for her, you know, at certain times, that type of stuff. But, you know, that's a side effect or a complication, for lack of a better word, of, you know, a your sling, of course. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but I, I thought it was fine. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? No, I think that was it for that. I just... Okay, perfect. No, I thought you did great. Thank you. All righty. Anybody else want to be on the hot seat? I see, uh, I'm going to say the name wrong, Anzi. I'm heading in your direction. It says you're self-muted. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Am I saying your name correctly? Anze. Apologies if I'm not. Anze? Anje. Anje. Yes. Okay, I don't. I, it, it, I don't see a J, but I'll say it. Anje. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thanks. All righty. Um, are you interested in a particular case? Let me ask you. Are you a subspecialist or a generalist? I'm a subspecialist. Do you want to? Oh, what do you do? Oh, so we're gonna do OB, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you looking for a specific case or just a topic? Um, I. I I will go with whatever you, you think would be good for me. And probably any topic will be good for me. All righty. Speak now, forever hold your peace, right? Yes. I I am getting a um 
a case list from a bog so i don't have a obg okay a OBG case list right now so when's your exam november so never so when are they going to uh, pass that to you i think it's three weeks yeah. before the exam perfect and you got to know it like the back of your hand yep okay yeah i mean that's a tough one but it is what it is all right cool so we're going to jump into it. What is the definition of postpartum hemorrhage? Postpartum hemorrhage is um, bleeding, uh, blood loss um, of more than 1,000 cc's of blood um, in the first 24 hours from delivery for a vaginal. Does it matter for, for, what type, for what type of delivery? For a vaginal delivery. So a thousand cc's for a vaginal delivery? Yes. What about a C-section? C-section, I'm not sure exactly, but I would say 1,500 or more. So what are the risks of postpartum hemorrhage? I guess what gives you a greater chance of having that? Um, so let's start with... Um, um, multiple gestations, um, anything that distends the uterine cavity, so uh, large for gestational age, um, baby, um, multiparity, um, uh, long labor, um, any sort of infection, um, prolonged uh, labor, um, and use of um, um, tocolytics for a long period of time. Um, since the receptor is uh, sort of um, going to be, the response is going to be blunted. Anything else? I'm thinking, yes, definitely should be more. Um, um, so sort of, let me ask you another question. Okay. What are causes of postpartum hemorrhage? Uterine atony, um, laceration to uh, the vagina, the cervix, uh, uterine rupture, inversion of the uterus. Anything else? Talked about chorioamnionitis or infections. Um, definitely more. I'm just trying to uh, think. Okay. So can you discuss for me the urotonics that are available? Name me the medication, dosing, frequency, contraindications. Okay, we have oxytocin. Um, the most common one, uh, you said frequency, it's given a certain amount of units per minute. Uh, I think you, you generally put a 40 units into a bag of one liter, and that can be given over an hour. Uh, we have um, hemabate. Um, the dosing, I believe, is 250 micrograms be redosed every 15 minutes, I want to say. And what's um, the route of administration? It can be intramuscular or intramyometrial. And what's uh, a contraindication? Hemabate. Um, asthma, I believe. So you said uh, how often you could repeat it? 15 minutes. But I'm not what, positive. What's the happen. maximum number of doses? I believe it's six doses, but again, I'm, I'm a little bit stretching my knowledge right now. Okay. What's another uterotonic? Um, I said uh, a methogen is another one. Um, so that is can also be given uh, intramuscular or intramyometrial. Um, the dosing, I don't know. 
and um, or maybe it, yeah, yeah, I don't remember, and uh, I don't remember how you know, many. You know, the, the frequency? Frequency, again, it's somewhere in that 20 minute, but again, I don't know for sure. I would have to look this up. And what's a contraindication? Contraindication would be hypertension. Anything else for your uterotonics? Um, oh, uh, right. Uh, so, uh, side attack or, um, um, oh my goodness. It's called, um, I'm blanking on the brand name or generic name. Uh, Prostaglandin E, I believe, one. Misoprostol, is that it? Mm -hmm. um, dosing would be um, 800 micrograms, and it can be given rectally or orally, preferably rectally. I understand orally you have nausea and other side effects that are very unpleasant. And usually it's given once, but it can be redosed. Um, I, I don't know exactly the frequency of that. And any contraindications? I'm sure there are. I don't remember. So any other uterotonic, any other medication you could give? You can give, uh, for hemorrhage, you can give tranexamic acid. Um, one gram within three hours of delivery. Um, you can give um, that's that's about all that I remember right now. So uh, let's say oh, you have. A, yeah, go ahead. There's one more. Uh, you can do a synthetic um, factor. Oh, no, I don't remember. I think it's 10. But I'm, again, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I'm not sure. So let's say you have a patient, you did her delivery, and while you were doing her second degree laceration repair, she starts bleeding. How would you evaluate this patient? I would... Um... First, make sure that uh, if I'm worried about a hemorrhage, I would let the nurse in the room know as well as the patient. Um, I would want to make sure that the patient has adequate anesthesia and uh, that she has adequate access with um, two large uh, bore IV needles and make sure there's uh, some fluid going. Um, make sure the patient has some oxygen. Um, I would uh, then... Um, Make sure that I, I would um, do a bimanual exam to, to feel, to see the most common thing is uterine atony. So I would try to attempt to um, do a uterine compression. Uh, and while I'm holding pressure on the uterus, I would also try to see if, if the placenta that came out is, uh, is intact, if there's any missing parts uh, of the placenta. Um, and uh, that's how I would start the evaluation. Um, let's stop there. What do you think? Um, I mean, I think I need to read a little bit more. <laughs> well, yeah, you're an oncologist. So I'm sure everybody else is a generalist. This is a pretty straightforward question, but somebody who doesn't do this, uh, you know, for a while, you struggle. Um, but, you know, easy enough. We're going to discuss it now. So nope. definition of postpartum hemorrhage, accumulative blood loss greater than or equal to 1,000 cc's or blood loss accompanied by signs and symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours after the birth process, regardless of mode of delivery. Oh, okay. Okay? Okay. You were correct with your risks of PPH. Now, when I asked you what are the causes of PPH, um, you said laceration, uterine acne, you didn't say anything about retained products, mm. inversion, and coagulopathy. Right. Okay. So methogen 
is 0 0.2 milligrams IM every two to four hours. And you could give it uh, contraindications hypertension. Hemabate is 250 micrograms IM every 15 minutes for eight doses. Hmm. Contraindication is asthma. Mesoprostol is 1,000 micrograms. We do 800 as well per rectum or 600 micrograms sublingual, usually one dose. Mm -hmm. Lately, I've heard people saying you can give two doses. I trained one dose okay. with no contraindication. Mm -hmm. okay. You could do, like you said, transaminic acid, one gram IV. If initial medical therapy fails, it works best if used within three hours of delivery. And some people are saying you could redose it like an hour later. But I guess if you're going in that route, I mean, you're, you're having problems. So the question here is when would the massive transfusion protocol be initiated in your hospital? I would initiate um, the massive transfusion protocol if I was concerned that I will need more than four units of transfusion for the patient or uh, there is a significant amount of bleeding happening. Is there any limit that you would say if she loses this amount and is still bleeding, I would it, you know, talk to anesthesia to start initiating it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say at the point where I'm worried about hemorrhage, we've already lost about a thousand cc. So I would say if there is, uh, if it's not something that I can easily identify and I think it's going to take some time to, to figure out, I, I think I would just, uh, discuss it with the anesthesia and start the um, massive transfusion protocol. Because some people are of the opinion in some facilities, some institutions, that it should be initiated or discussed at a level of 1,500. Okay. And you said that's how much you should lose in a, in a C-section. If I'm not mistaken, usually 1,500 cc blood loss is for a C-hiss. But even then, you're going to lose a lot more than that. If you're not really well-versed and have a good accreta team, for example, or whatever, or somebody who does this routinely. Mm-hmm. But you're an oncologist. You must. I mean, I'm sure you get called for those cases all the time. I do, although luckily it's not all the time. But yes, they do okay. happen. Okay. Where you work, is there an accreta team? We don't, but we're working on okay. getting one. Okay. Okay. Um, in regards to evaluation, I thought you did well. Um, I mean, I would focus more on evaluating for any lacerations. Okay. Um, have you heard about a wall clot? A what? I'm sorry? A wall clot? No. Okay. So you get a red top and you're supposed to either put it in your pocket or you tape it against the wall mm -hmm. and it should clot within eight minutes. If it does not clot within eight minutes, there's DIC or you're heading in that, that mm -hmm. area. You said a um, red so top? Just, it's a red top. Okay. Nothing with a, like a heparin in it. You know how some, some tubes have heparin? That's the old way of doing it. Because it would take for, it would take forever to get the labs to run for like fibrinogen and PT, PTT. So you just would do a wall clot. And I'm talking about 30 years ago. So if you know you're looking at the clot on the wall and it's not coagulating, you're like she's in DIC. So would you, um, I guess in practice, just to say, do that and put it on the side and, and still yep. check that way? I mean, it's faster yep. probably, yeah. Yep, it is, yep, 100%. But again, that's old school. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, let's say she had acne, you give her all the medications. Let's say she doesn't respond to the medications, what would you do? Um, she doesn't respond to all the medications. Um, uh, I would at this point I would uh, make sure that the anesthesia is aware. Uh, we would transfer the patient to the um, OR. Mm -hmm. um, I would um, probably make sure that either she's under general anesthesia or has really good adequate anesthesia with the um, epidural, mm -hmm. and would, uh, could potentially put like a Bakri balloon or okay. some other. Very good compression I mean because that's usually kind of what really works you know a lot of times if she's completely atonic you can stick your hand up there and you can really assess if there's anything retained so there's really no you don't need to mess around with doing a DNC 
Now, if you have any doubt that there's something retained, that's different. Okay. All right. Other questions? Um, let's see. Good job. Thank you. Um, question, I guess, would be, um, would you, um, how would you phrase if they ask me when I initiate a massive transfusion protocol? Just say when I, when I'm concerned, the EBL has been more than 1500. That's a good answer. Yeah, and she continues to bleed. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's what that's what I would do. I mean, Indiana, I always bring. I mean, because you're busy trying to figure out and do what you got to do. I'll, I always tell. I'll say to anesthesia, you better start setting things up. We need to get her get blood up here. You know, I think we're gonna have to call it the the MTP or whatever, and mm -hmm. they'll take it from there. Because you're busy, kind of trying to figure out what the heck to do next if she's hemorrhaging. You don't want to lose situational awareness, so you, you give that duty. Hey, and, and and if you have a good anesthesiologist, they're going to realize it, right? Because her blood pressure is going down or she's becoming mm -hmm. tachycardic, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's how it is in, in my facility. If somebody loses more than 1,500 and still bleeding, they start making phone calls. It's automatic. Okay. But I, I work in a hospital that has an accreta center, so. They're kind of used to it. Okay. okay Other questions? Um, in terms of what other things are, um, I guess they're going to have either postpartum hemorrhage or DIC situation on the boards potentially. I'm I'm almost mm -hmm. sure that's going to be a guarantee. I mean, this is basic. PPH. Oh. I think I know I got asked PPH. I never got asked about shoulder distortion. I did not get asked about breach. I didn't get. I did get asked about postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think that's a given. That's a given. I'd be shocked because it's something you really need to to be able to handle. Yeah. And yeah, I guess you can go into your hypogastric artery ligation shine there. <laughs> Even though they say you don't have to do it anymore to decrease the pulse pressure, well, but that's my question. Yeah, I mean, should um. Should uh should I go there or? Uh, it all to... depends where where they take you, where they take you. Because I know when I trained, and when I took the, my exam, that was one of the options mm -hmm. of you know if she keeps bleeding and whatever is to do a hypogastric artery ligation. Now it's not really discussed. And compression of the aorta is, is that also? You something? can bring that up. I know I know they do that in the accreta team. Um, I know right. us as generalists, we don't do that. And of course, you're an oncologist, so you have those special tricks. Isn't there that special clip? Yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, I, I, nowadays, I sometimes even uh, tie off the, um, the artery, uh, hypogastric arteries with a uh, vessel loop, and then sometimes mm -hmm. I, I can release it after. But, but I, I, don't I think know. because. Yeah, like how much to go. I mean, if you're an M, if you're gonna be tested by MFM, you start talking like that, they're just gonna gloss you over, and they're gonna know you know it, and they're just gonna move on. I highly doubt they're gonna be able to like ream you on something that you do. You know but what I guess saying? If I say like, should I say that before the hysterectomy? I guess that's my question. Yeah, yeah. If you feel comfortable, you know, and I don't think anything wrong with saying, you know, with my training. I feel very comfortable doing a hypogastric artery ligation. I, you know, I'm going to do everything I can because I have that skill set. I'm not saying you tell them I'm an oncologist, right? Um, but I do have that skill set. I want to do as much as I can. And as long as I know that her, you know, I'm not going to waste more blood, for lack of a better word, because I'm spending more time doing that. Because that's the concern. Are you, you know? But if you're going to clamp the, and you can say I have that technical expertise that I could do that and I know I can focus and see if I can save her uterus. I don't see anything wrong with that because they want, in this exam, everything's conservative. Now, mind you, as a generalist, I have I don't have that skill set. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess you, I, I highly doubt they'll take you because I'm sure the way you'll be presenting it, you can tell if somebody knows what they're talking about and then they'll just cut you off and they move on to something else. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, very good. So if anybody has any questions, just put them in the question box. I don't see anybody has any questions so far. 
If we're seeing anything out of turn, just let us know. Try to be as current as possible. Um, Jamie, I'm heading in your direction. It says you're self muted. Still says you're self muted. You, you there, Jamie? Give me a second. Somebody wrote a question. Somebody has two questions. Give me a second. Let me go to, I'm going to say his name wrong. I know, Jaron. Here we go. Can you please review the procedure for hypogastric artery ligation? Can you talk about low lying and marginal placenta and management? Um, to, to my understanding, I mean, marginal, if you have a marginal placenta, are you talking about marginal previa? Jerome? Okay, so I'm just gonna assume, can you unmute? Okay, hold on. Jamie, I'm gonna come back to you here in a second. Are you there? I'm saying your name wrong, say it again. Uh, it's Jaron. Jaron, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, okay, so. I guess if there's differences, because mind you, I'm, I don't, practice OB, so I, I need a refresher. Just Your oncology? I, yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, what, if there's a low line placenta or a marginal placenta, is that implying that it's not a previa? It's just maybe on the spectrum? There's such, there's such a thing called a marginal previa, so that you need to do a C-section. Now, your low line placenta, the concern is that if she dilates, is the, what's the word I'm looking for? She can dilate and then because she's dilating more, you hit the 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 placenta. Am I making sense? Yes, yeah, so they can That's still- That's the concern there. So realistically, you want the placenta to be greater than two centimeters away from the cervix. And there should be therefore no fear of it leading to bleeding. Am I making sense? Yes. Yeah, so- Mar uh, I'm gonna switch to two, but one of them means placenta is two centimeters away from the internal cervical os. That would be low line, and marginal low would line, be right. Marginal could it could be right at the edge of it. Some people believe that if you're beyond two centimeters from the cervical os, um, it will be not low lying anymore. So usually, if you're beyond two centimeters, you should be okay. Okay. It would not be low lying anymore, supposedly. Um, so, like, yeah, go ahead. So you would allow these patients to to labor, so, like if they have a. If have a low lying, yeah, because a lot of times things get. If there's any question that they could be in that range, you know, like one centimeter beyond, I would go reach out with my MFM and see what their two cents in, is. Is anybody is anybody an is an MFM on the call? Just put, put your name on the box. I guess nobody's an MFM. To and my I understanding, because... Mm -hmm. No, just once once we're done with this, I have a, I have a separate uh, just topic I just want to ask you to clarify. Go ahead. I got you on the call. Um, it's, you know, when I try to uh, just kind of freshen up on um, the rare types of ectopics and the management these days, it's hard for me to find things. So specifically cervical ectopics and corneal ectopics. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how, you know, what is appropriate management? Because it's just, I feel there's mixed things. It's like cervical it ectopics, some people say hysterectomy, right. same with corneal, but, but I know, I mean, you, you could try medical management, I, I would think that's more conservative but right so if you do if you do because the concern is they can bleed a lot and they could lose the uterus in either a cervical or a corneal ectopic so if you're going to give them medical management with methotrexate it's going to be the multi-dose regimen so you're going to give them the weight based it's one milligram per kilogram so it'd be the the one that's day one three five seven and then two, yep, four, and the six, eight. Yep, and the leukoborin rescue. Yes, if you're going to give them any medical management, you'll do that. 
Now, I know in some cases, if you do have a, a fetal cardiac activity, for example, in a cervical ectopic, they may put methotrexate straight in to the gestational sac or KCL. Because you want to, I don't want to say the word terminate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in order to make that methotrexate, once you give it, work better. To my understanding, uh, I have a friend who she does, she has done a lot of cervical ectopics and she says you'll give the methotrexate if, if the tissue is still there after the methotrexate is given after several weeks and it's still there, you could take her to the operating room, you'll do like a, an ECC kind of thing and uh -huh. she says that the tissue just comes out. I've never, set, I've never done it, never seen it, this is by her telling me this. I'm like, seriously? She goes, yeah, because the tissue kind of dies off and then you just want to slough it off or take it out so she doesn't bleed. Okay. You can do a more you... controlled thing. Mm -hmm. But again, I've never done this personally. Um, I have, Ashley Nicole says there's a pearls of excellence. They have a cervical ectopic one pager. Okay. I'll, I'll check that one out then. Okay. So then can I you comment on corneal? Corneal, um, you could do the same thing. A lot of times, a lot of, again, you'll do the, the, the multi-dose. But I know some people take those patients to the operating room and they'll do like, um, they'll put sutures underneath. I've seen that happen where you cross over once you cut that part of the cornea out and tie it off real quick. I know some people have used the ligature. They open like the blade of the ligature. And this is why I know somebody did that just recently in one of my hospitals. And I was like, that was pretty sweet. And she's like, the lady didn't bleed at all. Does that help any? Yeah, yeah. Those, I, are just I, harder. Those are just hard. I mean, I'm sure in your hands, you'll do a great job as an oncologist, but as a generalist, you'll be struggling. Yeah, I just didn't want to come up, you know, because I ask a lot of my colleagues and they're like, well, for a cervical ectopic, I mean, you just can send them for a hysterectomy. <laughs> you do, you, you know? should, yes, for both. Um, like, like you wouldn't both. be planning to do, you know, uh, a suction DNC, you know, you just... Consent for hysterectomy. Like that's what I. Well, when you read when you read the up to date, they're like, "Oh, you could do a, a DNC." I'm like, "I would do something before I do that, unless the lady's like hemorrhaging." I mean, I'd be okay. thinking about you know uterine artery embolization or something like that because she'll just lose the uterus. Yeah. You know. Okay. Well, thanks for. Um, I, I have Jacqueline. She wrote, "Low lying placenta can labor if there is no sinus proximal to cervix. Still at risk for PPH." Here's more info from perinatology.com. So it's www.perinatology.com, ultrasound slash low percent, 20 line percent, 20 placenta, HTM. Okay. Because when I was a resident, they'd say low line, we just delivered everybody vaginally. But I think we're oh. getting so much better with, with ultrasound, you know, but I know beyond two centimeters, you should be golden. If you're like one centimeter, I mean, as long as she's not a previa, I'd be very cautious and I would talk to my MFM and see what they think just to cover ourselves. Okay. And in the end, they can say one thing and it ends up being something else, right? Yeah. Yeah, MFM can only do as much as the ultrasound's giving them, right? Yeah. So I'm going to keep you on the phone here because I have from Christine to review hypogastric artery ligation. So I'm going to read something because you know, this is not something that I do routinely. Um, so it says the anterior division of the internal iliac artery can be ligated to control hemorrhage as it leads to the arteries that supply the uterus. The anterior division also gives rise to the obturator artery and the superior vesicle artery. So these will subsequently not be supplied blood after the anterior division is ligated. The circumflex iliac artery is a branch of the femoral artery. Hypogastric or internal iliac artery ligation is done when attempting to gain hemostasis in a cesarean section or other gynecological surgery and which other techniques have failed. Okay, most surgeons attempt to identify and control localized bleeding, hold pressure, correct a coagulopathy if present and use topical hemostatic agents prior to moving toward this technique. So it says often generalist OBGYN physicians are not experienced in this, so a more experienced or fellowship trained surgeon is often called to assist. However, you must know this option and technique for the ports. So how do you perform it? Okay, so you open the anterior leaf of the broad ligament, identify the external iliac artery, and follow this to the common iliac artery bifurcation. 
identify the internal iliac artery and follow this down about four centimeters before it divides into the anterior and posterior branches. Ideally, the dissection should be carried down to identify the anterior and posterior branches. However, this is difficult in practice in an actively bleeding patient. Therefore, the internal iliac artery is often ligated at its origin. Dissect away any nodal tissue and spread connective tissue using tonsil right angle. Separate the artery from the vein. Pass a non-absorbable synthetic suture or silk suture around the artery from lateral to medial. Would you add anything else? Um, I mean, I've uh, you know I've done it a few times, but we we try not to do it at the origin because of the you don't want to if you hit um, the posterior branch, and the patient has a lot of gluteal pain, or they say gluteal, you know, necrosis. So, not at the origin of the internal, but a little bit below. It's kind of, you know, 50% of us would say that. Maybe the other half would say it doesn't matter. Anything else you would add? Does that answer your question, Christine? So would you add anything else there? She said yes, it answers it. So thank you so much. All righty. Um, Jamie, I'm going to you next. I'm sorry. It says you're self-muted. Yes, I'm here. All right, sorry about that. You're there? Yes. Just want to get some an questions answers. Do you have a specific case you want to discuss or you want a topic? Um, Let me ask you, are you a specialist? To, are you a uh, subspecialist? Um, so I'm a generalist. You're a generalist? Okay. So you want a case? Uh, OB, specifically my case okay, hold on. three. Give me a sec. Hold on a second. Let me look for it. Thirty-four year old gravity three. Yes. P term P prom? Yes. Correct. Okay. Hold on a second. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So discuss the case for me. So um, this uh, patient of mine uh, basically presented to uh, triage with complaints of leaking. She was complaining a lot of pressure. She called the clinic, so I sent her um, to the hospital for further evaluation um, because she had a history of a, um, a cold knife cone before, and so she was at risk of preterm labor and cervical insufficiency. So when she came to triage, she was evaluated, and they saw that she was leaking. Her fluid was normal. Um, it, it was like 11, but she had said that she had been leaking continuously. So um, my hospital cannot do a fern, um, and I don't think nitrazine was ever documented. So um, let me ask you this, why, 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 why can't your, your facility do a fern? Um, they don't have the microscope available. I know when I was a resident, they, they away. don't have a microscope available in a lab. Not in not in the area where the, the residents. I work with just, residents. Just take it. Just take it to the lab. And then I asked the lab to see if they have it, and they said no, they don't. That, there's no way a lab does not have a microscope. That's ridiculous. That I don't know. Uh, again, I, this was not during my call, so the admission in itself wasn't me managing it. I took okay. over a week later. Okay. So me reading the notes. So, so the ROM plus was positive. So I guess the question would be, what could lead to positive ROM pluses? Um, it could be a false positive due to blood. Um, if it's, uh, I would say if it was not done appropriately. So 15 seconds of the swab is what's needed. So it, it could be that if it was not done properly, it could have a false um, positive. Um, I else an increase of afp because it does test for afp so congenital anomalies in the fetus um and open neural tube defects 
So what else happened in the case? So she was positive so, and she got admitted for P-PROM. Yes, five. so we managed her as as with P-PROM. So we started her on so latency. Let me, let, let me ask you this. What would be the gold standard test to see if somebody is truly ruptured? My understanding was a fern, but then I've read and then there's been some question about that. So now I don't know. There's another thing that somebody can do in order to assess 100% if somebody's ruptured. Oh, like pool, pooling in Valsalva? Mm -mm. No, nobody does it anymore. Is it a historical thing? Because I have read it where they inject yep. dye into the amniotic mm -hmm. sac and then there's a tampon mm -hmm. in the vagina. Mm hmm. Okay. And if you get blue coming out, she's ruptured. Nobody does it, but that would be gold standard. Okay. Right? It makes perfect yes, sense. Yes, Nobody correct. does it though. Nobody does it. So so let me ask you, what latency antibiotics did you use and why? So we used um ampicillin um and azithromycin. So IV ampicillin for two days, azithromycin one gram for one um dose. And then after that we switched to amoxicillin um, PO for five days. So why do you why do you use the amoxicillin or ampicillin and the azithromycin? Um to cover for gram negative uh, bacteria. Which one covers gram negatives? Uh, the uh, azithromycin. You sure about that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's say the patient is penicillin allergic. Then it would be clindamycin and gentamicin. What are the dosing there? I believe clindamycin is 900 milligrams IV. I don't know the frequency, and I think gentamicin is weight based. So one mix per keg, possibly. Okay. I would Continue, have to look with it up. Your, Continue with your case. So then we proceeded because she was 25 weeks to make sure we uh, gave her neuroprotection protection with magnesium, steroids of her fetal lung maturity if in case of delivery, if she were to go into labor, and then um, consulted uh, maternal fetal medicine and uh, NICU as well, just in case we had any issues during the hospitalization. We... Um, the magnesium also served not only for neuroprotection, but also tocolysis for the beta-methasone. Um, beta and then um, we proceed with expectant management. Um, and, and if in case she started to have uh, signs of preterm labor, um, then we would proceed with delivery. So in what time frame did you repeat the ROM plus and, you know, a when did she stop? Later. A week later. Which is when I came so they, over. So are they thinking she sealed or she really never was ruptured? I they were thinking that she would never was ruptured. Because and, other than the said, lady, which was kind of her, a, a, AFI was what on admission? Eleven. When 11. I looked it up on admission. Okay. And when they rechecked it, it's it remained stable. It wasn't really decreasing to less than five or an MVP less than two. Um sometime between the the admission time, maybe like a few days later, day four, day five, she said she stopped leaking. So there was this question of with her getting um, uh, another ultrasound with NSDBPP um, the next week, it, the AFI remained normal. So the uh, maternal fetal medicine recommended another ROM plus and it ended up being negative. Now it could also be negative because it was far from the time of leaking, but she, sub she delivered at 38 weeks without any preterm Complication. labor no, complications no so my in retrospect you know just you now know. You, you, she was getting cervical lengths because of the cold knife cone did she get a cervical length on that admission uh yes i don't believe it was shortened at all um no it was she had a normal cervix okay cervical length, sorry. so and your question is because it looks weird Yes, because how, I guess how do I explain what happened when I wasn't on call and then to explain the fact that she was managed as such and then discharged. It's just an you odd. Know, all, you can, all, all you can say is, you know, this is what the MFM recommended. I mean, the MFM is the one that should have put dye in, but nobody does it anymore. But that is that is gold standard. Very historical. Mm -hmm. But when everybody's sitting around saying, well, is she ruptured or not? I go put some dye in there. Nobody ever does it. Okay. Um, but that's how you would figure it out. I don't see anything wrong. You know, I came on, it was the week that I was supposed to be, if they asked you this, um, again, 
A lot of times they use the cases for, for, for topics, not necessarily specific questioning. It all depends on what your examiner is going to do. Um, I would say that, you know, when I came on as attending for that week, um, the patient had no complaints of uh, leaking. Her AFI really had not changed since the admission. So, you know, with consultation with the MFM, we re-examined everything and um, everything came back negative. So it was felt prudent to send her home. Um, and ultimately, believe it or not, she delivered at 38 weeks because you know what the final outcome is. Now, why there's no 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 microscope in your lab, I don't know what to tell you on that. That, that I did ask, yeah. and I'm trying to figure that apart out. Obviously, this is late, much you know, later on. Because I've been really told, I've been told, I've, I've worked in many different hospitals, and I've been told we we can't do for any hair. Go, yeah, you can, and I and I and I figure out how to do it. Right. <laughs> but we don't have no, I know we don't have a microscope it. here. I go, the lab does, and I just show up. Hey, what's up? I'm here to do a right. I'm like, yeah, we took it away from our triage when I was a resident, but I knew we could do it at another area. No. You always there's there there is, has to be a, a, a microscope on, in a hospital for sure. Has to be. I, I'm sure there is, but I, I cannot yeah. justify that when I wasn't there. Therefore, right, I, right, right. I explain that. I would just say the lab refused, the lab did not do it. Uh, we don't have a microscope. I'm not sure. That's how I don't know how to explain that part. <laughs> I went through the manager of, of of the labor floor, and unfortunately, we did not at that time have the faci the facility to perform a fern if they even ask you the supplies whatever okay yeah okay. <laughs> i mean they could always spit back and go well how hard is it to find a slide the lab will have a slide i could tell you that they will have a I slide I've, uh, I've never heard of an excuse like that before but i understand also at the same time i it's already done so no, but, and I, but I guess i guess you have to say you know i can only say i started taking care of this patient personally on day seven of admission. So as long as you know what the historical gold standard is, I think you should be fine. Okay, thank you. Um, so azithromycin is one gram PO on admission, ampicillin two grams IV every six hours for 48 hours, followed by amoxicillin 875 milligrams PO every 12 hours or 500 milligrams PO every uh, eight hours for five days. Azithromycin tar targets urea plasma or mycoplasma. Usually that's the main main thing, and chlamydia, but it's mostly the mycoplasma. Ampicillin and amoxicillin specifically targets GBS and many aerobic gram-negative bacilli and some anaerobes. Penicillin allergic with anaphylaxis is azithromycin plus clindamycin, 900 milligrams IV every eight hours for 48 hours, followed by 300 milligrams every eight hours for five days, and genomycin, five mg per kg for 24 hours for two doses. Okay. Any other questions on that? No, that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Very good. I'm going to see if anybody else has any questions. They've put it in the question box. Okay. Somebody wrote here. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Couldn't this just be a high leak that reseals? That happens sometimes. Yes, you're correct. It could be a high leak with early PPROM. Uh, but a lot of times they usually say, well, how did you really prove? Unfortunately, the testing that Jamie had access to was really not the best, especially with an AFI being normal. Um, that's a tough one. I wish she had access to a ferning, but definitely the gold standard is uh, putting dye and seeing if it came out. It says, can you also give erythromycin for latency antibiotics instead of the azithromycin? Yes, you're correct. The practice bulletin actually says erythromycin. This is from uh, from um, up to date, and in my hospital, we do azithromycin. So the antibiotic dosing for penicillin allergic is the azithromycin plus clindamycin, 900 milligrams IV every eight hours for 48 hours. Clindamycin, 300 milligrams every eight hours for five days subsequent to that for the oral dosing. And gentamicin, five milligrams per kilograms every 24 hours for two doses. Does that answer your question there, Michelle? Okay. Um, and then I have a question from Matthew. The other false positive for ROM plus, I know blood is significant. Also, seminal fluid can lead to a false positive, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
I'm looking it up right now if I can give you some more. Because I usually don't use that test much. If, do, 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 do. You're saying it's present of significant blood. It's really what it says. And this is just a quick Google search. Does anybody have anything else to add on that? I personally always do a Fernie because I think a lot of these tests, and the reason these tests came up in play is, you know, when you didn't have an OBED, you had a triage, it would be not to, you know, have the doctor have to come in and do a spec exam because back then, you know, the spec exam had to be done by, by the doc. And you do these tests, you stick the little Q-tip in the vagina and see what you can get. And hopefully the doc didn't have to come in. Does anybody else have any more info? I'm, I'm, I did a quick Google search and it just says blood. Because um, I know, I mean, I, I believe the amnesia would be positive with seminal fluid, if I'm not mistaken, and blood as well. Anybody else want to add to that? I'm just looking here in the question box. Okay, I don't see anybody adding. Hopefully that answers your question, Matthew. Okay. Usually the gold standard is is the the Fernie. Uh, or if you put dye inside the for sure the uh uterine cavity or the amniotic fluid. So does anybody else want to be on the hot seat that has not gone in the last several days? Misha, I'm going in your direction. I know I'm saying your name wrong. Says yourself muted. Says yourself muted. Hello. You there? Yes. Awesome. Is it Misha? Misha. Misha. Sorry about that. Do you have okay. anything to add about the ROM Plus? I'm not an expert with the ROM Plus. No, I do not. Yeah. Um, do you want to go on a specific case or a topic? What are you looking for? Uh, I like to talk about on my OB list, um, okay, case number 48. Okay, let me go find it. Give me a second. So OB case 48. Yes, please. Okay, discuss that case for me. Okay. Um, so she um, is a let's see, 24 year old um, G3P1011 at the time. Um, she had been previously admitted at 33 weeks um, due to poorly controlled type 1 diabetes. Her A1C was actually close to 15 when she initiated um, into our practice. And then um, she was initially admitted for just glucose control um, and then discharged. She followed up in our office and then was readmitted at 36 weeks due to a non um, a non reactive fetal heart tracing in the office. And then- So let me um, just interject here real quick. So she, yeah. what, what was she on for her type one diabetes? How was she being managed? Was she on a pump? No, so um, I'd have to look back through her records. Our MFM, I'm part of a group with all MFMs, and so they had managed her directly, but um, she was on insulin. She was not on a pump. So she was on like a, uh, like a sliding scale with meals, and she was on like, like NPH and Antus. What was she on? Yeah, she was on NPH um, and then your aspart for your short acting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no Lantus? Correct. No, okay, so just NPH and regular? Yes. So let me ask you this, how do you calculate how much MPH and regular to give a patient? So um, it's based on your trimester, um, if you're meant to start insulin. So your first trimester would be um, 0 0.7 units per keg, uh, second 0 0.8, third 0 0.9. 
um, and then that becomes your total insulin requirement. And then you um, can split it up between your like NPH and then your regular, and then um, or split it up between day and night rather, and then you split it up again with your NPH and your regular. So how do you split it up? I believe it's two thirds um, and then one third, but I'd have to look. I actually use a calculator if I'm gonna be starting both, but um, I believe it's something like two thirds and one third. And then when would you give the um, insulin? Um, so you wanna give it um, with your meals and then um, AM and QH, AM and nighttime. So can you give me more specifics? So AM with breakfast, before breakfast? Sure, so your AM and then we give with breakfast and then with lunch, with dinner, and then your QHS, then your nighttime. So let me just help you out here a little bit just for teaching. So okay. you do your calculation and you do two thirds, one third, right? And then you break it down that one third to one half, one half. Okay. And then the half you would would give it at, at your dinner time and then the other half at bedtime. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. Okay, continue with presenting the case. Um, so she was readmitted um, after being seen in clinic when she had a non-reactive tracing. Um, at that point, her blood sugar was 333. Um, the provider who was um, on at the time worked her up and diagnosed her with um, DKA. Um, I came on the next day and um, the decision had been made to uh, deliver her given her um, persistent category two fetal heart tracing overnight. The mode of delivery had already been determined. Okay, so let me, uh, let, let, me uh -huh. let me interrupt you. So they diagnosed her with DKA. Correct. And they said, we're just going to deliver her because she had a non-reassuring tracing. So it was really the two things, meaning the uncontrolled diabetes um, was like putting her within the reasonable time frame to deliver overnight after she had gotten um, treatment for DKA, it had all resolved. And then the decision had been made to um, deliver her. So once the DK resolved, she still had a concerning tracing? Correct. And then there was little, um, just because of her non-compliance, um, it was thought that it would be best to deliver her as opposed to um, continuing follow-up outpatient. So can you just give me an overview of how you treat DKA? Uh, sure. So um, one of the more important things is like fluid resuscitation. So you want to give at least a liter of um, sodium chloride, even in that first hour, as a bolus. And then you continue with about 500 um, cc's an hour thereafter. Um, you want to correct any electrolyte. Or did you say something? No, are you still there? Yes. Um, you want to correct. Can you hear me? Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to correct any electrolyte imbalances, um, including or more specifically with your potassium. And then you want to give her insulin, um, generally with a pump. How much insulin? Um, your loading dose is 0.2. Uh, units per keg, I believe, and then you can have a maintenance dose that can range from like two, uh, starting at two units an hour. Okay. What else would you do? Um, continuous fetal heart monitoring. And what would the fetal heart monitoring show you? Um, so any number of things. Um, it can, you know, still be your category one or your category two, but um, there are often times where the variability can be affected meaning uh, more minimal variability. And um, so how long would you have that type of tracing? When I came on, it had pretty much been since her admission the afternoon before. And it still continued? Correct. And because it continued, they elected to say, and her, and her uncontrolled diabetes to go ahead and deliver her. Correct. But, but
but was it felt that the patient was stable enough for delivery? Because yes. Of the yes. What was her What was her glucose level at the start of the induction, or her, this, for lack of a better, the start of her delivery or C-section? Mm -hmm. At the time of C-section, it was one seventeen uh, while mm -hmm. she was on her pump. Okay. Okay. So what else do you like to add on this case? She has the history of the shoulder dystocia. They can ask you about that. They can ask you about HSV. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess that's it. My biggest concern was um, the fact that she was delivered so quickly to her diagnosis. It was like a little bit less than 24 hours. Um, her labs had improved. So technically she no longer met that criteria in terms of diagnosing DKA. But I think that was my biggest concern, just 36 and 5, DKA. I think, I think, I think you, have, you have to say, you know, you wrote it, resolved DKA. However, mm -hmm. the MFM felt because of her poor control. I mean, that is a, that is one of the new recommendations that you can deliver. Like when I was a resident, there was no way on God's green earth you would deliver a, a diabetic at 36 weeks. Uh -huh. No way. No way. Unless there was something bad with the tracing or something like that. Um, you would wait to at least 38 weeks. And now you are allowed to say there's more concern that you can end up with an IUFD, especially in a type one that's mm -hmm. uncontrolled. Interesting, she wasn't on a pump. So a lot of these yeah. type ones are on pumps. Mm -hmm. She's not, she even, she's not even on Lantus. That's weird. Mm -hmm. on, how much insulin was she on? Like hundreds, hundreds of units? Um, I think what I saw on the chart was like 50. Um, when that's it? Wow, yeah, okay. because when we got her, she was a late transfer of care to the MFM practice. Um, and so they were kind of trying to, I think they first met her at like 31 weeks or 32 weeks, and they were trying to get her optimized for the rest of the time that they had her. Okay. So um, just, uh, oh, uh -huh. yeah, go ahead. No, my other concern, and I guess it's just kind of talking through it, is um, the patient had, she had a history of a shoulder dystocia, but that was at like 37 and some change. This baby was um, slightly bigger, like six ounces bigger than her shoulder dystocia. So to me, an uncontrolled type one diabetic, I think it would still be worth revisiting vaginal delivery, just given poor wound healing and all of that. So um, that was the other concern. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I see that, but I don't see anybody faulting you. I mean, the you know, it's, you know, shared decision making with the patient, you know, with the history of shoulder dystocia, a lot of patients just don't want to go through that again. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as she was fully informed and wanted to proceed with the C-section, I, I can't say that's wrong what you said, um, but nobody's going to fault you that she elected to go for the C-section. Okay. Especially with that history. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So just an overview of DKA for everybody on the call. Careful monitoring of labs, ABG, glucose, electrolytes every two hours. Regular insulin loading dose, 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 units per kilogram. Maintenance, 2 to 10 units per hour. Normal saline for a total replacement of 4 to 6 liters in the first 12 hours. 1 liter in the first hour, 500 to 1,000 cc's for 2 to 4 hours. Then 250 cc's an hour until 80% replaced. Then replaced with 5% dextrose and normal saline when glucose reaches 250 milligrams per deciliter. Potassium is normal or low, add KCL, 40 to 60 milliequivalents per liter. The potassium elevated, wait until decreased to normal, then replace the KCL. Bicarb, one amp, 44 milliequivalents to one liter of half normal saline if the pH is less than seven. You do not perform a stat C section with that bad tracing because when the DKA resolves, the tracing should improve. Okay? Okay. Does anybody have any questions on that one? Very good. No other questions? I don't see anybody putting anything in a question box. Melissa, I'm going in your direction. You there, Melissa? Yes. All righty. Um, are you interested in a specific case or um, any topic? No, what are you looking not really. for? So uh, we haven't hit any office, so if you want to just pick something from there, that sounds you fine to me. From office? You want office? Are you a generalist or a subspecialist? Generalist. You're a generalist. All right, discuss for me your ovulation induction protocol. You want to take it back? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
my ovulation induction protocol. Um, so, uh, if assuming that I've already, um, done some sort of prep with the patient in regards to trying to attempt for, um, and exclude other specific causes as far as infertility. Um, Let's say her complete infertility workup is negative. Okay. So just um, go straight into what, what your ovulate, what ovulation induction protocol you follow in your, in your practice. Um, so I, um, am comfortable with, um, two medications with ovulation induction. I am comfortable with, um, Flomid as well as with Letrozole. Um, so, so when do you decide to use one over the other? Um, so, um, in my population, um, I, uh, tend to recommend uh, letrozole if I have a already um, if if I've already been able to specifically diagnose a patient with PCOS. Um, with so you're however, in your practice, in your practice, if somebody has PCOS, you would use a letrozole over Clomid. I yes. Why is that? Um, the um, the information regarding letrozole um with use in pcos has been shown to be better as far as um higher live birth rates um so that has been um just proven to be better as far as with pcos as well as um increased rates of ovulation in those patients so, so what is the mechanism of action of letrozole um it's an aromatase inhibitor what does that mean? Well, it's when by doing that, it's going to um, I believe it also disrupts the conversion of um, oh my gosh, I don't know why I'm blanking on this right now. That's okay. So what's the mechanism of action of Clomid? Clomid acts as a, um, a therm, as an anti-estrogen. Anti what does that mean? Acting as an anti, acting as an anti-estrogen and will increase FSH and LH. Okay. So discuss your induction protocol for me with letrozole specifically. Cause you say you use um, letrozole usually, correct? Um, yeah, so um, with um, letrozole, I start with a dosage of 2.5 milligrams daily for five days. Um, I instruct the patient to start it on. Specifically, um, spe uh -huh, go ahead. You, you're going um, to where I, I was going to ask. Start it on um, day, um, day three, four, five, day three of their cycle um, for five days. Um, then um, depending on uh, when, how long the patient's uh, menstrual cycles have been recently, I do try and bring them back for, um, a, uh, pelvic ultrasound. If, if they have somewhere in a range of like a normal, um, normal menstrual cycle, like 20 to 30 days, then I do have them come back for like a mid cycle ultrasound somewhere around like day 12, 13, 14, um, depending on the day of the week, what works for the patient, um, checking to see if there's any, uh, dominant follicles. Um, and I when do you know have, if they have a dominant follicle? Um, I'm usually looking for like a, uh, follicle size. Well, I'm looking to see as far as like if ovulation is to be occurring soon, like a, um, like a, I would, uh, that may show me that the, the, there was an appropriate response to the medication, say like, um, greater than 15 millimeters, um, size many times, like closer to like the two centimeter size. Is there any other testing you can do to confirm if somebody ovulated or not? Um, Yes, you could um, perform like a progesterone level around like day 23 or so, but that would be more, that would be more considered like after the fact. Okay. So let's say the patient does not ovulate. What would you do? Um, so I could consider 
uh, increasing the dose to five milligrams of letrozole for a following cycle. Um, typically with my ovulation induction protocols, if I'm using a specific medication, um, if I were like if I were to be using letrozole, I would usually um, stop after three cycles. And if they um, if they were um, not being successful, then I would um, discuss with the patient in regards to if any other additional workup needed to be done um, versus um, possible okay. um, referring them to REI. What other uh, possible workup? Um, well, for example, um, some patients in my practice will opt to um, try a cycle or two of Clomid before getting a semen analysis. I don't so is require. That, is that would that you know if it's a male issue and you and you do ovulation induction, aren't you just wasting time? Um, well, if, uh, for example, no I matter may, much, no matter how much she ovulates, she won't be able to get pregnant if he doesn't have a good semen analysis, correct? Correct, but I've um, I may not have the patient get a semen analysis if their partner has had a child before. Okay. What about an HSG? Um, yes, like I I I encourage and actually recommend HSGs before um doing before giving medication for ovulation induction even, even if she, even if she's had babies before no not if um for for primary infertility specifically i would in, okay. i would more recommend an hsg prior to starting ovulation induction medication okay so let's say she does not ovulate on the 5 milligrams of letrozole what would you do um, I am not comfortable. I, I understand that you may be able to um, go up to 7.5, but I am I don't feel comfortable going past five milligrams myself. Um, so after um, after five, if I I can also choose to um, repeat another cycle at five milligrams once again and see um, if there's any response as far as that. Um, and I've done the same with Clomid before, is like repeating a um, a 100 milligram dose more than once. Um, so where's your, but, where do you start your dosing off in, with Clomid? I start at 50. Is there anything different that you would do with Clomid versus Letrozole in its um, in the protocol? Um, no, my um. My timing as far as when I administer the medication and follow-up is um, essentially the same. Okay, very good. Let's stop there. Good job. Not an easy topic. No. So letrozole is, like you said, aerobitase inhibitor. It blocks conversion of androgen to estrogen. <laughs> so I was thinking that in my head, and for some reason it just sounded silly. I don't know. Like that's hot seat talking or something. <laughs> uh, and clomid inhibits normal estrogenetic negative feedback, which results in increase in pulsatile GnRH secretion from the hypothalamus and subsequent FSH LH release. With PCOS and a BMI greater than 30, the live birth rate is higher with letrozole at 20% versus 10% for clomid. But remember, as to my understanding, as of today, FDA has not approved letrozole for ovulation induction. I believe that has not changed. Right. You can do from day three to day seven or day five to day nine or two of the protocols. Letrozole is 2.5 milligrams. You don't ovulate five milligrams. You can go up to 7.5 milligrams. But again, some people do not feel comfortable doing that. Clomid is 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, 150 milligrams. Again, some people don't like going as high as 150. Realistically, if the patient does ovulate, you should not exceed six cycles. Now, I don't know. I'm not an REI, but realistically, and I saw your point. If she, the, the 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 FOB had had children before, I guess the semen analysis. But then I like what you said. So then I try to spit it back. Well, you know, what about a HSG? And I know a lot of times insurance doesn't pay for this stuff, right? Right. Um, 
So you're kind of stuck between that rock and a hard place. Uh, it's a 21 day progesterone and usually it is a greater than 220 or two centimeter um, follicle. You said day 23. Okay. Progesterone. So I have a question that says if we do not do something ourselves like ovulation induction and no one in the practice does them, can you just say that you don't do them in your practice but discuss the theory or should we know the dosing mechanism of action and all that? You had a, a generalist should know how to do basic ovulation induction so you should know that. There's nothing wrong with saying I personally do not do, do this in my practice. However, to my understanding, this is what is done. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question, Jessica. So that is basic generalist information. So you should know that. Any questions, Melissa? Good job. I do have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I know the answer. My one case um, on my infertility list, uh, like on my infertility, um, that happened to be, so uh, if you see on there, it says like semen analysis offered and an HSG was pending. So that happened to be a patient where like both a semen analysis was offered as well as an HSG op offered and, um, oh, you know, I might have just been mixing up my two cases, but um, is it like, I, I understand that ACOG said, talks about like doing semen analysis and HSG prior to giving ovulation induction meds, um, but if I, you know, recommended them and they declined and wanted to proceed with medication for one or two cycles, am I going to be discounted for that? No, I think you got to be very cautious and, and say, you know, I was very clear with the patient that the recommendation is this, uh, this was going to be an out-of-pocket expense for her. And I was very clear that it, if with two cycles, nothing uh, occurred, I would not proceed with any more um, cycles and uh, recommend the semen analysis or HSG or whatever the case may be. Okay. I don't see anything wrong with that. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Good job. Um, I know we're past time, but I, I, I have no problem putting one person else on the hot seat. Does anybody else want to be on the hot seat? Lauren, I'm going in your direction. It says you're self-muted. Can you hear me? Are you there, Lauren? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Do you are you have a specific case or a topic? What are you looking for? Um, I do not have a specific case. Okay, are you a specialist, subspecialist, or a generalist? Generalist. Uh, any specific section? Um, maybe we can go back to do some OB. OB. Okay. I'm thinking. So you have a patient who comes in for her first prenatal care visit and she has a history of bariatric surgery. How would you evaluate this patient or what would you do differently in her prenatal care because of that history? Um, I would want to get an idea of when exactly she had bariatric surgery, if this was recent or many years ago. Um, also, you know, if she's in that recent surgery time frame, um, if she found out she was pregnant during her active weight loss period, um, and with them, I'd also want to know what kind of bariatric surgery she had, like a gastric um, sleeve or band versus a ruin Y, because that can have an impact on, um, like a ruin Y is more likely to cause issues with malabsorption. Um, so after so getting let's on, say, let's say she had a row in one. Mm -hmm. um, so that bypasses um, part of the intestines and can impact the absorption of different electrolytes and vitamins. And so they're more prone to deficiencies. So what else would you do differently in this patient's prenatal care compared to another patient? I want like everything, like her weight gain or how much you should, you know, what would you do in your lab evaluation? What would you do? 
Yeah, so typically with our initial prenatal lab, I'd want to make sure to get some um, nutrition labs as well. So checking like their vitamin D, folic acid level, calcium, and also closely monitoring their weight throughout the pregnancy. Um, their weight gain would be dependent on their current pre-pregnancy BMI. Um, and then I would also want to, you know, especially those patients who are in that acute phase where they're they were undergoing weight loss and then got pregnant, I would just really emphasize to them that we don't want them to lose weight during the pregnancy. Um, and then I'll usually replete their um, deficiencies if they're low at the beginning of pregnancy and then check them at least every trimester to make sure that they're remaining in a, a good range throughout the pregnancy. Um, and then I also usually will work with my MFM colleagues and do serial growth ultrasounds in the third trimester to make sure that baby's growing appropriately. So you said that you would want to know like when she had the procedure done. If, if, if somebody had um, bariatric surgery, what time frame is recommended to, to not get pregnant after um, the procedure? Well, they you, they don't want you to get pregnant during the active weight loss time frame, or I believe it's about a year and a half after your surgery. And um, what else would you be looking for or do differently in a in a patient? Let's say she started off with a BMI of forty. Now her BMI is thirty five. Um, so are you saying forty before her surgery? Or at yes, the beginning. And, now, and now 35 after her surgery. And now 35. Um, so with patients who have um, an elevated BMI above 35, you could also consider doing antenatal um, surveillance starting at 37 weeks um, because they have a higher risk of stillbirth. And then also um, nutrition counseling for the pregnancy, I can't remember if I said that or not, to mm -hmm. help them with their, their diet and making sure they're gaining the weight that's appropriate. Um, and how much weight is appropriate on a weekly basis? So for the whole pregnancy for a patient who is obese would be about 11 to 20 pounds. Anything else that you'd be on the lookout for being at a BMI of 35? Um, gestational diabetes would be something that you could early screen for so you could do that early on in the pregnancy and then if that's so normal how would, how, would, how would you screen the patient for that um typically i would do a one hour glucose te tolerance test if that's normal then i'd repeat it at 24 to 28 weeks um if the initial early glucose tolerance test is abnormal then i would follow it up with a three hour so um, let me ask you this seeing that she's had a row and why can she do a Coca-Cola? So it depends on if she has a history of dumping syndrome. So if she has a history of dumping syndrome, then I would, um, you could do an A1C early in the pregnancy, but you could also do glucose paneling. Um, if they do not have a history of dumping syndrome, then you could still do the glucose test. Um, but if it was recently that she had her surgery, she may not have experienced that yet. So you might err on the side of doing serial glucose testing. Anything else at a BMI of 35 that you could be concerned about? Um, she had an increased risk of hypertension throughout the pregnancy, so keeping a close eye on her vitals at her visits um, and monitoring for preeclampsia signs, um, fetal is growth. Anything like could, is there any, anything you could do for prophylaxis? Um, to reduce the risk of preeclampsia, you could give her aspirin. If she has, um, so if she has that and other risk factors, because I believe BMI would be a moderate risk factor, so you'd want to have at least two moderate risk factors to give aspirin. Um, any baseline labs? Um, yes, you could do baseline, like with your nutrition and early pregnancy labs, you could add baseline um you know, like CMP, which would also have part of your electrolytes that you're checking, and then um you could do a baseline protein as well. So um, let's say, you know, she's going through her prenatal care and she says, doc, I really don't want to get pregnant. What do you recommend for contraception? How would you uh, counsel her? So if she is, um, 
so it kind of depends on like our mode of delivery. So if she doesn't want to get pregnant and she ends up having a cesarean section, you could do a tubal at the time of C-section. Um, otherwise, you could consider hormonal management. Um, typically with obese patients, the, the better options would be doing um, like the levonorgestrel IUD or the copper IUD um, because those aren't impacted by weight. Um, I usually try to stay away from Depo-Provera for these patients just because they it, it could cause weight gain and then they're kind of in that constant battle of, of regaining weight um, with the Depo. Um, you could also consider the Nexplanon um, for her as well because that's very effective. What's the mechanism of action in Nexplanon? Um, Nexplanon is a progesterone medication so that... Um, works to thin lining of the uterus. It also inhibits ovulation and can thicken the cervical mucus. What's the primary mode of uh, action? Primary, I believe, is inhibiting ovulation. And um, what does the next plan on contain? Um, etonogestrel. Do you know what, how much? Yes, but I'm blanking on the dose. <laughs> Um, would she be a good candidate for oral contraceptive pills? Um, so she could, um, however, there would be a slight increase in um, blood clots and um, so that might increase her risk. But it's because of her obesity? Because of her obesity, but it's not contraindicated for obesity. Um, now, what about with a history of her bariatric surgery? With the history of the ba bariatric surgery, that could potentially affect the absorption of the birth control pills and make them less effective. So it wouldn't be the best option. What about the patch? Um, the patch is not recommended for women who are obese because of the um, in the decreased efficacy. And what is the the is there a cutoff a BMI? Um. There is, and off the top of my head, I want to say 25, but I'm not, I can't recall exactly. BMI of 25? Yes. Okay. But I can't recall exactly. Hey, anything else that you would do in your management of the patient in her pregnancy? I don't think so. Okay, let's stop there. What'd you think? That's all right. <laughs> So the recommendation is to delay pregnancy for at least 12 months. It used okay. to be 18 months, but this is according to UpToDate from a year ago, in order to optimize weight loss and reduce the potentially adverse effect of post-bariatric nutritional deficiencies. So you can get metabolic and nutritional derangements, especially if we're rowing wide. Um, you should check on iron, folate, vitamin B12, calcium, vitamin D. And some of those patients are already on like B12 injections and whatever, and just continue those. And the recommendation is you should check their um, these uh, the testing every every trimester. Uh, it's about a half a pound weight gain in the second and third trimester a week. You want to do nutritional counseling. They usually do not tolerate the glucola, so you got to do your your a glucose log for like a week or two. Baseline PIH labs, consider low-dose aspirin in the second trimester, EKG, monitor fetal growth, consider antenatal testing, and you deliver by their due date. Um, Edonogestrel is 68 milligrams. That's what the next one contains. Main mechanism action is inhibits ovulation. However, when you're hitting toward the third year of it being in place, then comes the thickening of the cervical mu mucus and the thinning of the lining. But the main mechanism of action initially um, is inhibiting ovulation, but the longer it's in, it may not prevent that ovulation. So then the other things, kind of like the depo, come into play. Mm -hmm. um, it is not recommended. I believe it's a, a three um, in regards to the, you know, the re recommendation of contraception if somebody has had uh, bariatric surgery, especially like a row and Y, to take oral contraceptives. Mm -hmm. um, so they recommend transdermal. However, you are at uh, increased risk for VTE for some women who are obese. Um, and according to the package insert, 
less efficacy if you weigh more than 198 pounds. 198 pounds. 198 pounds, yes. Um, any other questions? I think that covers it all, I think. Hopefully I'm not missing anything. Well, they kind of prompt a little bit. Say again? Well, they kind of prompt a little bit because I feel like there's things that, that I that I didn't think to say and, and you gave me some kind of nudges. I did. And I did, it, I did it for just education for everybody on the call. I mean, I mean, you know, I remember being in your guys' shoes, you know, many, many moons ago, and I used to love better the structured cases. And um, because, you know, it's everybody is getting that question. Mm -hmm. That's why I like doing topics with with because, um, you know, when somebody discusses their case, there's nothing wrong with that. But everybody else on the call, are they getting any benefit out of it? Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I have a question here. Is aspirin still safe in patients with Rowan Y and gastric sleep? I believe because you're doing such a low dose, the risk outweighs the benefits. Now, if she was on NSAIDs or something like that, it'd be different. Those high dose things, like you would not give her NSAIDs uh, for after her C-section, or for example, or after she delivers. So I believe because it's a baby and enteric coated, I believe it's okay. Because you have a lot of those gals that are on, the, on that. Anybody disagree with that statement? That's from Matthew. Are you there, Lauren? Do you agree or disagree? I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I think I think it's gone to, I mean, she's going to be a super, BMI of 35, she's going to be at super high risk. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but I think, you know, for post-op management or, you know, postpartum management of analgesia, I would shy away from anti-inflammatories for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but you also, like, going back to what I was telling you, um, Lauren, yeah. you want the people that are on the call to get something out of it as well. For sure, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So that's why it's it's hard. It's hard, I think, for the caseless defense to get everybody kind of getting something out of it. So my apologies, yeah. I if no. I um, <laughs> prompted you, but you answered them appropriately. Okay. I mean, but it's hard when they're like, "Well, what would you do? Tell me whatever, you know." And it's kind of like, "Wow, <laughs> just you know, tell me the differential." You know, go back to that always. Um, but just more for 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 teaching purposes. Again. It's your caseless defense, but also the other people on the call, you want them to get some out of it. So you kind of ask questions and stuff like that um, to hopefully have some salient points for that particular topic. Because if you think about it, there's only so many topics that we do in OB for GYN. Yeah. So you just focus on those. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, think, I, I think you did a good job. So, um, so very good, good, good. Um, so, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Cause I know we're past time, but we were able to get somebody else in the hot seat. Matthew, I hope that answers your question. Um, again, I'm not an MFM, but I believe, um, the risk outweighs the benefits of having that baby aspirin, especially in, 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 in it's in court. So can you review best drug for GBS? Hold on. It's break. I don't. Drug for GBS, UTI in pregnancy. Okay, um, so if somebody has, so of course, if somebody has a positive GBS in their urine, they're automatically GBS positive, so you do not have to do a culture. But a lot of my understanding, because that's happened in the hospitals that I've worked at, if somebody is GBS positive in a, in a urine culture, they usually don't run a um, sensitivity. It's because the assumption is um, penicillins will be treatable. So when you call the lab to talk to them, say, hey, you know, why didn't you do any sensitivities? Well, we really don't do sensitivities. So they recommend a penicillin derivatives. That's what I've had in my, my, my practice. Does that answer your question, Daniel? I mean, can you give her macrobid? Yeah, but when you talk to the lab, you know, because when you talk to the pathologist, you know, because the pathologist, pathologist runs the lab, like, you know, what do you, well, usually, you know, it's penicillin uh, sensitive, so that's why we don't we don't run the sensitivities, um, and then take it from there. Which is interesting because we have patients that are GBS positive in their culture, and they do and then and they do like if if they do sensitivities to see, and they're not doing it as much, but it depends on the hospital you work at. Because some places still do, you know clindamycin sensitivity and stuff like that. So I find that interesting, which you're not going to give clindamycin to treat a UTI. 
So it's like counterintuitive, so to speak. But speaking to to the lab, that's what they tell me. It's like we assume it's going to be sensitive, so we recommend you know an ampicillin or a penicillin derivative. Okay. Um, any other questions? I tried to to do topic based and focus in on questions. It's again, it's hard on the caseless defense when somebody has a uh, a particular uh, case they're concerned about. And of course, this is the point of this. So that's why I always ask, do you want to do a topic or you do have a specific case? And, you know, but it's just to try and get everybody to learn something from that. I, I do want the, the candidate to get their questions answered in regards to their case. But that's why I ask questions that hopefully I know somewhat of an answer to and can back it up um, for learning purposes. So hopefully that helps. So I have a question here on, on topic of obesity. What is the recommended preoperative workup for an obese woman undergoing gynecologic surgery? It's going to be dependent on their age. That's going to be important. And then you have the Caprini score, right? So the Caprini score will tell you about the risk of VTE and the need for, everybody's going to get SCDs, right? So then there's a question of depending on, I think if you have a moderate Caprini score, I think if it's greater than eight, there is a complete practice bulletin and discussion of, about VTE and GYN surgery. Um, then they're going to recommend the SCDs along with uh, uh, anticoagulation prophylaxis. Um, again, uh, their history. The patient has heart issues or anything like that. Does she need a cardiac clearance? And that type of thing. Does that answer your question, Angie? Sleep apnea, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for that, to be honest with you. I would see what anesthesia would say. I would go with my anesthesia provider. I would definitely um, have them follow up with anesthesia, like a pre-anesthesia consult, see if there's anything they'd like to add. Um, but to my understanding, I'm trying to recall what I've read in the past. Pulmonary testing is more of an issue if somebody has COPD and those type of things. I could be wrong, not necessarily for sleep apnea, but definitely if you're concerned, you could touch base with the anesthesia provider or automatically. Like I know if we have somebody who's really, really obese and OB, we automatically get an anesthesia consult for them, um, you know, to see if they're a candidate for uh, the spinal, for a C-section or what have you. Uh, I'm thinking... Pulmonary testing is not done for sleep apnea, but I could be wrong. I, I would have to check that. So I'm sorry, Anja, I can't tell you 100%. I think it's more for COPD and any um, pulmonary issues, you know, um, other than that. But, I, I, you know, I'm just, it's in the back of my mind. I don't think, but again, just go to, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying I'm going to touch base with my anesthesia colleague um, and see if they do any other recommendations. Of course, if the lady has no neck or anything like that, that could be a hard intubation. That patient should be seen by anesthesia anyway, right? If somebody has a bad airway, you could be in trouble. So if there's any doubt, there's nothing wrong with having anesthesia evaluate the patient and see if anything else needs to be done for that patient for clearance. You may work in a small hospital and they may say, we should not do her here. She needs to go to a bigger center. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Um, any other questions? I mean, I'm going to put everybody's hands down. If somebody wants to ask a specific question, um, Raise your hand, or you could put it in the box. Jessica, do you have a question? Um, is this from before? I know you have a question in the box. I know I answered that before. Um, okay, so your hand came down. Rafi, if you have a question, and Rita, or is it from before? Is any, if anybody has a question, can you put it in the box? Because I got a couple of people with hands up. I don't know if they're from before. So I see Elizabeth with her hand up. I'm going to go over there. Do you have a question, Elizabeth? No, I don't. I, I'm trying to figure out uh, all this time. I think my hand has been down when I've meant for it to be up. To be up. I'm sorry. So this means my hand is up? I, I see it. I didn't see it before. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um. Do I have any information about Clomid alone versus Clomid with IUI? Ooh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an REI specialist in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I do believe, and I cannot give you numbers, you do have a greater 
success rate because it's an it's you're doing with the IUI. Um, but I, I would have to look that up. Hannah, I can't give you more specifics, but definitely I believe if you do IUI, you got a greater, greater chance of success to my understanding. But again, I would have to look that up. So then I have, am I correct in that patch OCP increases the risk of ETE, but HRT patch decreases the risk compared to oral? Correct, because of the first pass effect. But that doesn't happen with the OCP, because remember, the OCP is a higher dose of estrogen compared to uh, the HRT patch. Okay, you are correct. There's other things involved when it comes to... Uh, other things involved with the uh, the patch, okay? So hopefully that answers your question. I have somebody else that's on the call here, but I they're not. I can't find the mic that's open. There it is. We'll turn that off. So hopefully that answers your question, Sally. Which bacteria is covered by ampicillin in P prom? Uh, amoxicillin, specifically Tarkis GBS, and many aerobic gram negative bacilli, and some anaerobes. Okay, so Sally, hopefully that answers your question. Um, I'm trying to remember because I believe I re I remember reading something several years back in regards to the patch. I'm talking about birth control patch that the the bioavailability is lasts longer than anticipated. And that's why there could be a greater risk of VTE, something of that sort, which you don't have with the HRT patch or, or the estrogen patch usually. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question, Sally. I'm sorry, Hannah, I don't have any more information in regards to Clomid with IUI, but to my understanding, it will increase your risk of um, pregnancy when you do IUI on top of, because you, you try to time that in the right time and you have Clomid with the ovulation and all that. So, um, other questions? So hopefully everybody on the call found this beneficial. Again, it's hard with the case list defense to try and make it topic based unless somebody wants a specific uh, wants a topic question. Um, but of course, that's why I ask if you have any issues with any of your case cases because we want to clarify that and not get any curveballs on the exam itself. Um, so other questions. So, so let me see. So Hannah says, my understanding is for unexplained infertility, a clomid IUI is preferred. There you go. Just to increase the risk of getting pregnant, of course. Any other questions before I let everybody off the call? But I appreciate everybody that participated. Everybody did a really good job. I mean, sometimes I do ask some really hard questions, so my apologies, but I really want people to learn. I know the clomid, it's like, yeah, but that's a general OBGYN topic and you, you should know the basics of it. So hopefully that review did help um, I, I'm trying to remember who asked that question. Let me go back to the question box here. That was Jessica. So hopefully that's a nice overview for Jessica. Okay. Um, can you give erythromycin for late stage instead of is it? Yes, you can. Somebody, I, I see that. Yes, you can. But I think I answered that before. Yes, the practice bulletin actually brings up erythromycin. It's actually up to date that does azithromycin. I'm used to doing azithromycin at my hospitals. Um, any other questions before I let everybody off the call? Hopefully everybody found this uh, beneficial, maybe not. Um, but I wish everybody a, a good luck continued studying. I know we're, we're coming down a home stretch for some of the people that are taking the exam in October. So um, any other questions? Um, if anybody wants to put anything in the, in the question box, anything to improve um, these caseless defense, webinars for for people to get a good benefit out of it i'll give a couple of minutes for um, people to type anything in the box if they have any other ideas because we're always open to suggestions um but again i want to thank everybody that uh participated they everybody everybody did a great job and uh, i wish you guys a good rest of the week and a good night and if i'll stay on for a couple of minutes if anybody wants to type anything else in regards to how we can improve the uh, webinars seeing that we're coming down to the home stretch. Um, I wish everybody a good night. Thank you.